is Batman, Cape Crusader, so-called woke? Probably. Is it a problem with the show? Maybe. Am I going to focus on that? Hell no. Got enough problems on its own. Let's start with the antidote. After the first three episodes, I tried explaining my initial impressions of Batman, CC, let's just call it that for short, to someone. And I started with the example of the female penguin. I got past the part where the she penguin is now a mother with two sons and about how she talk to the rival crime boss, Rupert Thorne, and he just, you know, let it slip that he avoided the destruction of the warehouse because a little birdie warned him about the destruction of that. And he hinted to this Miss Penguin that it was one of her sons who tipped him off. So I go on to say that she brought them both into the room and basically just kills one of them after some very cringy, cliche dialogue. I was trying to get to the point where the older son, you know, the real traitor or the little birdie, you know, was going to go talk to Barbara Gordon to get protection from his mama. That's where I lost this person. They suddenly asked, really, how old are these sons? Uh, so I guess early 20s, maybe later 20s. They were like, okay, that's stupid. I don't need to hear anymore. Why would they call Miss Penguin Mama? I tried going on, but they were done. They didn't want to hear anymore. The funny thing is <laughs> that wasn't really my issue with that. It was more that Miss Penguin took Thorn at his word and killed the wrong son, then had the older son, who wasn't even well established to be Miss Penguin's son. It's in there, but mm, yeah, they hinted at it, but someone who was a big fan of Batman, the animated series back in the day, it really didn't register, you know, all so quick until Miss Penguin brought them into the room with plans of killing one, the wrong one. Seriously, it was like Miss Penguin was like, oh, the person I was trying to kill told me that there was a traitor. Let me believe my enemy and kill my son. So she got the wrong son. And then when she sort of got tipped off by the guys who were on her payroll, that yeah, she was a dumbass for killing off the wrong son. And the other son, who was the real traitor, came into the station, you know, she could have had, you know, dumb or some goons quietly take out all of this. They're right there. But no, she had to fucking use the artillery weapon that she used to take out the warehouse to fucking bombard Gotham PD instead. Now I know this is a cartoon, but man, she must just want to get some shit blown up instead of actually solve her particular problem here. Or maybe, she, you know, she really wanted a fight with the Batman who she had no clue about at the time and was just setting it up for this particular thing here. There was other things in this first episode that I could talk about, but I, I don't know how they can pale in comparison to just that. Yeah, I was disappointed how flat or one-dimensional the characters were coming off on this first episode especially harvey dent but but overall that stuff is sort of fine and it actually sort of plays out a little bit well with how they set up the superficial elements to at least a certain degree over the series but i'm doing this play by play so i'll get to it within time besides that the only really what the fuck moment i had was when batman popped up to save barbara gordon i was like where did he come from I've seen other people use this scene as, what, Batman kills now? I'll tell you right now, if you take those people serious as a piece of real serious criticism, then this review isn't for you. Because A, we don't know if those people hit by the car are going to die or not. And B, that's some bad faith criticism, and that's stupid on several different levels. And C, why are people being such moralistic jackasses about this sort of stuff out there? You have to engage with the medium on its level. And given this is trying to be some modern day Frankenstein between the Golden Age, the Royal Batman, and some other stuff, who frankly historically didn't care that much if criminals he stopped lived or die several different times throughout his history, that bit of criticism sort of falls flat. So I was wondering how he appeared at just the right moment, but you know what? I assume he was stalking her in the shadows or, you know, something like that. 
And speaking of that, that's, that is exactly what the show shows. He pretty much does the entire next episode, except for at certain key moments. But instead of Barbara, it's Montoya in the second episode that Batman was shadowing. It's really the best explanation for why it makes sense in the first episode, which could mitigate my WT moment from earlier. Initial impressions and all, sometimes what comes after makes what comes before make more sense. And sometimes it just confuses things even more. But that's jumping a little bit ahead. Let's rewind it back to when Montoya brings Wayne into what I have to assume is Gotham PD office. So I guess more time since Gotham's been bombed by the artillery strike from Miss Penguin. It just seemed like a flimsy excuse to introduce Lucius Fox into this show. And I have to admit, they played it off quite well, even given some possible insights for all the characters. Montoya is a hothead uh, with a good heart, and Batman uses his Bruce Wayne persona to sort of get to know this detective and what she's all about. Still, what Lucius says sort of drew my attention to this element of the story, strangely enough. It's a paradox. It both makes sense and calls attention to the nonsensical nature of Bruce's actions. Don't know if that was intentional or not, but it will be an issue for some. So Montoya goes on the hunt. She's got to look down this pretty woman who Playboy Bruce took out for a date and was the last person to see her. There's elements of coincidence, maybe contrivance in here that is gonna keep on bopping up, just to warn you. So she goes talking to people at the studio to try to figure out all of this. Strangely enough, why doesn't she have a partner like uh, Bullock and Blass are together? Or does she have a partner who's just so ill-equipped? Did I miss something there? She's such a strong, independent woman. No one wants to be her partner. This is why she's... Is this why she's Gordon's? You are my number one. So getting to the first thing I found, you know, just a little bit strained is when Batman comes on the scene. There's a chase scene for the yet unnamed villain. And, you know, they're running along. And somehow the villain drops a ladder. And somehow Batman knows, even though he shouldn't, that this will injure someone below and loses him. Or maybe I should say her. We don't know yet. In an attempt to save someone that Batman shouldn't even be aware of. Maybe he just has daredevil-like powers now or just hyper aware. He is the Batman. Sonar is possible in the, anything in this world, I guess. Or maybe I wasn't paying enough attention. Or, more likely, the writers needed a reason to let the villain escape. Either or. Now, pretty standard stuff. Detective stuff. You sort of have a twist that isn't complete shit. But for anyone who knows about it, let's not dwell too much on this episode. It's fine. Overall, nothing stands out as great. And did have certain little moments that I liked. Call back from uh, the golden era of Hollywood. And it was funny in an incredibly campy way that is i just wish i could say the same for the next episode i mean seriously the begin setup is just trying to do too much at once the selena kyle introduction was interesting enough but seriously what made the journalist remark on bruce's mother in that moment to get bruce to hit him it was a moment that i missed on first viewing so i had to rewind it i'm like why did bruce just hit this guy it even took me a few seconds to realize this journalist looked Looking at the sort of pearls all suddenly brought up her murder. It was there something about it on the fucking um, plaque? How she was murdered? It's not like it's a recent... Uh, okay, fine, fine, fine. Yes, he was talking about Bruce's mother. Isn't that just a coincidence with Bruce Wayne right behind him? Maybe he was trying to bait this scene, okay? There's just nothing in the show to really, really indicate that. Old hockey Hollywood movies from the era that the show is set in. And talking about that, you know, new show, new Batman. You know, even though it's a, even though some people are marketing it as a spiritual successor, Batman the Animated Series, it's it's really definitely not three, which maybe it's going for. I mean, there's this Arrow Flynn sort of sword fight scene and this whole guillotine sort of thing that, you know, maybe they used it in horror movies, but it personally reminded me of, you know, a Bond villain 
all of it seemed, you know, oddly out of place here. Fine enough, decent story device for, you know, inserting standard backstory for Bruce Wayne, adding a little bit more with a sort of Alfred sort of angle there. And you know what, curiosity did kill the cat, but it didn't kill the bat. So why, why, why would have he been, you know, wanting to look at the therapist's file on him? Was he giving her anything? Do they think they have a previous psych report? Let's just disregard the sort of therapeutic standards in this particular era because they seem to like arkham should be a fucking sanitarium where people are getting electroshocked and all sorts of other inhumane things but the show sort of waters all that down go with the ultra chic modern aesthetic but i'm getting ahead of myself so why be so concerned enough to steal the therapist file on himself oh that's because to indicate she's so smart that she predicted that then then you have Selena's transformation into Catwoman, completely done on seemingly a will, completely done on like a whim, and because she's tired of being poor, can't find any other way, you know, like getting a job to make any money or other things, like sell something off. Something that'll get brought up later at the end of the episode, but not in the way you would expect. And you would figure it would be much easier to sell off your own fucking stuff than stolen stuff. But let's set that aside for now. She does this whole thing. She gets caught by Batman after, you know, embarrassing flask and bullet just a little bit and so she's sent to court where we get a little bit more harvey barber actions inserted in there convenient way to fit that in there by getting her in court and go let me not even get into the overarching thing where she's a rich wealthy or at least seems that way so she gets off with a slap on the wrist and this continues to highlight barbara's virtue and harvey's shortcoming so i assume a certain amount of time has passed i don't know it's not very apparent selena is back to cat burgling again and again batman's on the scene we get a good chase look she slips he has to catch her oh isn't that sweet we get a kiss then a taser then somehow she has a catmobile and then somehow she has a catmobile that was obviously inspired by her in awe of his batmobile I wonder where the hell did she get the money for that? Because you can't steal that. You have to actually pay someone to remodel a car to get that sort of... Never mind, never mind. It is for the fun of the show. Fan service. Uh, yeah. And that's not even really getting into all the little stupid stuff that sort of add up into this episode. So, you know, minor problems. It just sort of grades on me throughout the episode. It felt very contrived and rushed for all the elements they were trying to cram into this episode in such a short time. I seriously wanted to like the flashback moments with Bruce and Alfred in it. It's just really all the overly harsh moments and you know of course a flashback within a flashback mixed with all the sort of stupider nonsensical silly moments that uh, crop up here and there especially selena kyle slash catwoman's maid that really made us feel like an uneven mess with horrible tonal shifts that practically cause whiplash and at the end the ending the bat and the ending I'll give it some credit. It goes full circle. The trap Batman sets brings back Martha's pearls at this particular museum. The biggest WTF moment I had was right here. Like how the hell did she get a Jaguar into the museum with her? And why the hell did Flash try to kill Catwoman? Oh, I, I know. He's set up as a petty ass bitch. I'll come back to that. And you know, it almost makes sense at the particular time why Batman got the photographer to now be there to take those pics. But why even have the scene where he's like, oh, we have photos of you beating up those two police officers because they tried to kill this woman who was running away. It would have been much better if Batman didn't do anything, just like send him a message. Print it off. Did he want to get, did he want to piss off the police officers or did he have some sort of faith that the fact that the police officers were trying to kill fucking Catwoman because she hurt their pride? 
Yeah, I mean, the series tries to justify these things and use these things to sort of characterize things like Flash being a homicidal maniac and other shit like that. It's just so crammed together and super contrived in a, such a series that it makes me think all these things were just done like this for the sake of of the story doesn't take uh, the character it's just so crammed together and so super contrived it makes me think all these things were done just like this for the sake of the story moving around the characters like pieces on a chessboard just setting things up to be hell with the believability of these fucking scenes or really what makes sense for any of these characters to do. Again, the Jaguar, the Jaguar. It just doesn't make sense to me. Okay, gotta let that go. You know, a couple of these things spaced out a little bit longer, given more flesh, more room to breathe, might make it a little bit better, besides the Jaguar thing. But machining it all out like that just seems set up for the next few episodes. Why having one of the lamest, laziest, origin stories for why selena kyle became catwoman and met batman all in one episode it had all the right parts on paper could have been a good idea but again the execution of it was just such a mess episode four actually is something i could call good you know there's a few little nitpicks here and there that you know only felt a little forced in a few places and he did have a rough start, you know, with the whole police trying to bait Batman into stopping crime so they could take him down. Unlike with Flask and Bullet trying to kill Catwoman in the episode before, them killing Firebug felt realistic for those characters to do within that particular scene. Even if the meek villain has seemed to have surrendered for rather odd reasons given his supposed mental conditions frankly i think it would have worked much better if he took off the goggles given that's when his sort of delusion was indicated by the actual show but it does make sense for them to do that given how things turned out within this episode at least and i sort of like the mirroring that was done with this law enforcement people going rogue and coming up with a plan to get the batman that highly destructive overall you have an unlikely partnership between gordon and batman within it that made sense at least from the beginning, you know, I think there could have been a little bit more uneasiness between the pair, a little bit more suspicion between at least Gordon or Batman. But aside from that minor thing, it was mostly well executed. And again, some of the stunts earlier on to catch the Batman makes this sort of partnership maybe come off a little bit too easy and come off a little bit too hokey but does fit the setting, the era, and sort of the tone of the show overall. The only thing that did really feel off is how the psychologist character, Bruce's therapist from earlier, I don't know to give her title-wise. No, if I didn't know she was Harley Quinn or whatever readdressing of that character, it sort of makes sense in retrospect. So the setup for that is actually fine, maybe even good. Besides that, the reason I overall enjoyed this episode, despite some minor flaws, it doesn't just throw action, plot, dialogue at a breakneck pace, given really moments to breathe instead of the schizophrenic fever dream pace that it been sort of raging on with for the first three episodes. Now, episode five almost had me, but then I, I stopped to think and I have so many questions. Like why did Batman take out those patrolmen and not just escape in that one scene when he was cornered? Or why are all these rich people going missing, being held in captive for assumedly long enough to be brainwashed by their actual therapist without getting reported or noticed that they're gone at all? And why is Barbara going to take the word of a madman over her friend so fucking quickly? Well, of course, Barbara's right by believing the crazy guy over her friend and pursuing it, but wanting to believe her friend is truly not what the madman tried to sort of make her out to be. Makes sense in context why she might believe him. She is a defense lawyer after all, and darn ethically proud one with almost no flaw at all. 
and the show did sort of have something to explain why no one knew these rich people were secretly meeting with this therapist. But it's still hard to believe that none of these rich people, even if it was a secret meeting, wouldn't have told anyone that they were doing this or to not come look for them after they miss enough meetings. You can headcanon in explanations for it, but I'm finding it rather hard. And I'm still confused about why Batman took out all those patrol officers before escaping. Sure, it was, it was a bit cool to see. Would have been cooler if Batman did the same to Flask and Bullet, who were in the same room. Maybe he just assumed that they were the people that were least likely to catch him in that situation, being as incompetent as they've been shown so far, and genuinely being rewarded for it. That's the corruption of Gotham. Now let's get to the one part I've seen plenty of people talk about. The infamous kiss scene between Harley and Montoya. Yeah, weird. But so is them getting a phone call brought to their fucking table. This is clearly a high-end, high-class restaurant. It is even established earlier when Gordon was in there when they were making the date that this was a very exclusive and hard-to-get-in restaurant. But Harley had the hookups for it. Remember, context matters. And it's way more believable that they could do something like this within even the 40s or 50s. It is way more believable that they could do this, especially given the sort of Hollywood uh, aesthetic that it's given for this particular era, even if the show doesn't really, really follow it very well. That people not familiar with the history of Hollywood, even though Gotham is in Hollywood, it is everything. It's New York, Hollywood, it's everything all at once. They obviously have movie studios. Who the fuck knows what Gotham is? It's a uh, all-purpose city. Let's move past that and say it felt like that a restaurant like this would have a sort of Vegas mentality in here. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. At least a policy like that in a place like that. Now, if they were just doing this in public on the streets, I could see this having a little bit more merit, but that's public. This is a fancy, tancy, rich, upper crust place. And the show makes it very clear. There's different rules for the rich compared to the poor. Plus, it's way more believable than half the other shit that occurs in this episode and the series overall. Hell, the culture warriors criticizing this should have a bigger issue with the fact that even though Harley's being portrayed as the bad guy, the show frames everyone she fucking tortures and puts into a pit as worse people than her. But what would I know about that? Also, the chef kiss at the end just makes me think that the writers wanted to have their cake and have sex with it too. Oh, look, Harley notices Barbara's card as she's leaving Batman for Dead in this fucking mansion. Of course she would notice that, and of course she would go back for her, because she's one of the good villains. It, it just seems rather patronizing overall. I mean, I understand morally gray villains are a thing, but seriously, it doesn't matter how well the setup was done, which was done mostly properly, I have to admit, to set the precedent for her going back to say Barbara and, you know, getting to make my eyes roll like a parody version of the girl from The Exorcist. After all of that, you know, the audience are probably thinking, well, she's dead. You know, she redeemed herself in the end, blah, blah, blah. You know, I understand wanting to bring her back later, but literally Montoya gets a phone call from her just a little bit later. That's why I had the line about the cake. I can at least understand why at least some people would like this, but fundamentally it breaks my brain in many different ways because this can be done well. I can understand the thought process that has been put into trying to get this to work in the show. I think in trying to set this up, they hurt previous episodes, such as episodes where they introduced a new Harley. I just can't even in good faith figure out a plausible backstory for how this Harley, given the information presented in the show, to give her the necessary motivation to do what she does in the story. 
Also, the fact that every villain so far was so weakly motivated for sort of their turn to villainy. It makes it harder to believe any of this given how much they're changing in the Batman mythos. Fundamental problem I see with rewriting a lot of these characters is people go into expectations of Batman with certain things in mind. And if you want to reinvent characters, you know, with a gender swap or any sort of variations of any way, you should at least establish the characters a little bit better so we can understand how they can be separated in our mind from their previous incarnations. A Miss Penguin was sort of stupid on her own. Don't need much backstory to really explain how she got how she is, but this Harley Quinn, I'm not understanding uh, the point A to her B in this fucking particular episode here. And given the sort of Joker reference at the end of the entire season, I'm wondering if they're even going to connect this Harley to him at all. And even if they do, I don't know how they're going to connect the two in a way that will make sense how she's presented in this season. Maybe it can be done. Wait and see on that particular matter. Now, I hope my brain isn't so broken by this that uh, my explanation of this didn't come off as a disjointed rant of complete raving lunacy. Now, the next episode starts off like an episode of Scooby-Doo. I just went in hoping that the writing didn't match that lovely stupid show because why? I won't hate on the old school Scooby-Doo, no matter how hawky and stupid it was. Probably for the kid and nostalgia factor, it really doesn't fit this or even most Batman shows overall. You know, I, I like this quick clash of ideas between Lucius Fox and Alfred here. Additional supporting role by Bruce Wayne. And you get uh, more additional interactions between Bruce and Fox afterwards. Isn't bad at all. I keep wanting to call this good, but I got to wait for the penny to drop. And these interactions in this episode for these three, and the interactions between these three, you know, makes the sort of forced and sort of silly introduction of Lucius Fox in the second episode come off a little bit better here. They're using this character. They're just not going to throw him away, not only for plot reasons, but for a, a little bit of character development via dialogue to sort of tell what sort of people are might come off a little bit stiff a little bit uh, annoying at times still there's many things up to this point and past this point frankly that i can understand people sort of being irritated with in this show that i think comes forefront within this episode sure there's gonna be some who are like you go girl because the blatantly obvious messaging injected into this just slaps you in the face up to a certain point i could almost even say this episode is good until you start seeing the pieces fall into place. Let me just go into my main problem with this. What motivation does a ghost have for robbing money for the poor? Even given that, there's a good reason I brought up the Scooby-Doo reference earlier. Because what does a ghost want with money? So you assume it's just some villain. But it's not, you find out. And the fact that he's robbing money for the poor just makes it seem like this is twisted in such a way. It's just a, a version of the Robin Hood story flipped on its head. And that isn't good writing. That's just extremely lazy writing. Yeah, they explain it in there, but it just doesn't make sense. I mean, at least he was a loyalist, so he's not you know, a patriot, and they had some sort of contrived reason why he hated the poor in his error. So, of course, his ghost would also hate the poor. So he would target these big funding for charities. But poor in his past does not make sense why he would be robbing from them, at least in his backstory. Again, he was a loyalist. Pretty much one of the people in the American Revolution who sided with England, the king. Wouldn't it have made so much more sense for him to have stolen from, you know, the good old patriots back in the American Revolution instead of just poor people who would have had no money? 
yeah, we have charity nowadays that are raising money for poor people. This is just so ham-fisted that the logic doesn't seem to have worked. And maybe some people are going to wave it off because they are fine with the messaging of the series so far. Or they're going to completely just dismiss this as a crazy guy back in the day, loyalist, losing his money, so going a little bit crazy. But it just doesn't work for me. Probably doesn't work for a lot of people once they think about it. Sorry if I just made you think about it and that you liked the show before and now you don't. So, hmm, I wonder why they would have had him steal from the poor over the Patriots. Again, given he was a loyalist to the crown during revolutionary times. Yeah, probably no particular reason. In short, good execution, piss poor logic to really back up the motivation for the bad guys. And this has been the most blatant example of that in this series so far. Not that I hated the ghost angle. Some people will, just matter-of-fact-wise. There is also one scene that starts to give some nuance to sort of Harvey Dent's character here. And the sort of Bruce Batman asking for advice from uh, the help. And the subsequent uh, bonding that is done from that isn't completely horrible front basing. At a certain point, I'm like, okay, functionally, this could be a good episode. It reminds me a bit of, you know, some earlier Supernatural episodes. But the blatant messaging is just so insanely out of place. It makes it hard to praise any element of this show and drags down the series as a whole. Much as I dislike the third episode, and I will admit, functionally, this episode was way, way better. I guess it's sort of like the fact that Bruce doesn't accept ghosts exist and once you sort of understand the other side does exist that's another threat it's another thing that exists in the universe you can't go back you can't unsee it once you see it you just don't want to talk about it much because some people will look like you're crazy if you rave on about it so who are you gonna call batman batman let's see if lucky number seven can reverse of the series. It has a strong start with a dynamic father and daughter duo verbally sparring with a good hook established before the credits and a strong follow up that, you know what, I could nitpick, but I'm not going here. Well, besides this one. Seriously, maybe staying right here in front of the window isn't the smartest decision Gordon can make when you have a hit out on you, or at least think you do. They also play up the stubborn, hard-boiled police commissioner angle a little bit too much for my taste. I mean, at a certain point, the stubbornness to such an absurd degree really comes off as just blatant stupidity. I, I really don't want to assume that this was done for the sake of the show's messaging or if they really just wanted to make this his character and let the women in his life, Barbara and Montoya, you know, talk some sense into him. Not necessarily a criticism, but I do think the show could have used his time much better, you know, like fleshing out other things like Batman's investigation. Not necessarily a criticism, but I think the show could have used its time more efficiently to sort of flush out other things like Batman's investigation part of the story. That seems rather rushed. Oh, sorry, it was done in a way so the flatfoots can be caught flat-footed. My bad. Also, how much is the bounty on Gordon? I know it was doubled, but it seems like it's rather large crew that comes out after the initial hit is sort of foiled. Again, uh, nothing too wrong with this episode. It's just really annoying to have villains like this. I was also thinking that they would definitely try to do a betrayal of Gordon's trusted inner circle. Look, I'm not even going to question how Batman got into the prison to rough up not only one, but at least two inmates. He probably used his... Never leave the cave without him. ...to bribe the couple to dozen people he would need to, or maybe he learned ghost tricks off screen from the previous episode. I I'm sure there's more plausible ways he got in there and did what he did. But if they're going to explain how he did that trick, then uh, I'll just headcanon some of the most ridiculous ways he could have pulled it off 
that I, I want to hear. Okay, I want to try to enjoy this episode at least, despite the flaws. So I said, Lauren, let's just get this over with. The episode Nocturne seems to start off with a crossover with Adam's Family Wednesday. Very cool. I I'm glad the carnival doesn't actually have a mad scientist who does experiments like this on actual little girls on the payroll. You know, I figured it was a carny trick. I figured it was a typical carny trick, but you know, it was going to go with and I really do hope they do something with those two boys, given one is named Dick and the other's Jason. And yeah, clearly this is intentional subversion to make you think they're killing off the stand-ins for Dick Grayson and Jason Todd. I mean, who would even think about doing such a thing? I'm pretty sure this is an accident. Pretty clear that most of these kids are stand-ins for, uh, you know, the Bat family that comes about that we all know and love. Try to brush it aside, these kids don't actually die so it's just the easter egg like the greg ghost reference here with alfred reading in the car it's not well established why bruce gets beat by the carnies here seriously just why so this wednesday adam's a uh, girl got this girl steffi I heard that's another reference to the Bat family. Not one I'm very familiar with. Again, you find out they'll recover. Gets in a fight with her brother, this Wednesday knockoff character, who is apparently in the comic book also as an adult. Why are they trying to age down all these people from the particular series? I don't know. But you know what? Tragedy does a child good. Look what it's done for Bruce. Okay, I get it. They were trying to protect their most vulnerable little corny in there. It just really doesn't make too much sense. The whole attack on Bruce by the carnies. Okay, I'm sure there's something in there. And there's clearly a stand-in for Croc in here with the sideshow freaks. But why did they beat him up? And why does he give credit to the bearded woman? Probably because it's a funny joke. Fair enough, fair enough. And of course it was the and of course it was the tomboy, the sort of member of the Bat family reference, who's the one who ends up helping Batman end up saving the day. Yeah, I don't want to talk much more about this fucking episode here. Okay, we're almost to the gold line. Yeah, but I do have to mention, you also do get to see Dent finally taking money, you know, for his campaign, which is something I've neglected, you know. He has a certain condition, deal with the devil, all of that. And of course, this leads into the birth of Two-Face. Now, originally, I thought this ended at eight, and I was really hoping that would be the case, but maybe that's just wishful thinking. Sort of like the sort of dream. Harvey starts off the beginning of the next episode. Of course, Thorn Muscle got in unseen. Maybe he learned from the Batman. Sorry, it's much more believable than anything Batman did by breaking into the fucking prison earlier. But it is just a little bit lucky that that, that hired thug was just waiting in the right bathroom and that dent went into that bathroom. Maybe studied sort of did sort of patterns maybe he has a habit of always going into that bathroom at a certain point of the day or blah 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 sorry uh that was much more believable than anything batman did by breaking into the prison but it is lucky he waited for dent in the bathroom and, and maybe it's more dent was unlucky enough to go into that bathroom at that general time but may maybe it was his after trial habit of his who knows? Not gonna watch it again to see if that is established in the story. Not worth it at this point. Still, Harvey Dent's descent into madness is a bit refreshing to see, as morbid as that might sound, given the sort of way the insanity of some of the earlier villains came off rather weakly characterized and hard to understand. Hell, I could barely tell Harley was insane at all. She was insane, right? Not even sure about that at this point. She came off more as a whimsical and queer. By queer, I mean both means of the words, both the weird definition and the homosexual one. Again, I, I'm probably being too critical there, or, or maybe I'm not being enough here. I was really liking the direction of this episode until Pennyworth guilt trip. Yes, Bruce Batman pushed Dent. But really, for someone so concerned with the mental well-being of Dent, 
Alfred isn't exactly being very tactful with how he's dealing with this with his employer, foster son, whatever weird relationship that is trying to be built here. Like the relationship between those two is just giving me some serious whiplash. It's been all over the place. I would say it's been hot and cold, but I, I don't think it's even been quite that. But you know what? That definitely is very reflective of family. And given the state of Bruce and all of that baggage, it makes a little bit of sense. Sure, the framework is there to support. Seems to be every time they have certain issues is more plot driven than character driven, but it's just a pet peeve of mine. I really have to wonder if the Thor and father son time is supposed to be reflective of this. But you know what? It's really interrupting Dent's awesome revenge arc with, you know, pesky, touchy-feely emotions. So, you know, I'm too much of a man for that sort of shit to get into that. That shit's for women. Ooh, that tracks, that tracks. And grats for this. Batman let the criminal die instead of saving him. I, I don't think he really could have saved him. But I am sure there's going to be certain people out there who might be annoyed by this particular decision of the Batman here. I'm not sure if they should be taken seriously as critics. Because I can say that definitely fits at least this Batman for this particular series. And I still want to cheer for this episode. I can really get behind it besides some minor grievances. An uh, episode I can actually call good. There was hints of that before then. I believe episode four was close second behind this. But you know what? Let me not diminish it anymore. I don't even care that the father son thorn thing didn't even really have that great of a payoff. It built the character well enough. It gives a little bit more dimension to a character we haven't seen much of by introducing the son and all that complexity there. And it does the job. Little cliche, the son trying to save the father, blah, blah, blah. But still, now this is where the series should have ended because... Yeah, should have done the cliffhanger thing. Going into this, it doesn't even take a minute before they freaking ruin it with something I'm sure they thought were clever. It didn't even really take even a minute in before they sort of ruined this with something I'm sure they thought was clever. But as I pointed out before, without any thought behind it, uh, this sort of stuff can come off as lazy writing. Yeah, there's precedence for it, blah, blah, blah. Now that I'm saying that this opening is necessarily bad, it definitely does seem like something this Barbara would do. Now, I I'm not going to call her girl boss or Mary Sue, just because I, I hate the reductive nature of that, uh, but it might be a little difficult for me to actually argue against anyone trying to actually make that claim about her. Again, small little things start coming into the mix and making me question several different things. Nothing too bad. Bruce using this Batman voice uh, when he was uh, meeting with Dent in the fucking Arkham, which is way too fucking modern, clean, and healthy looking for my personal taste, especially given the era they live in. But, but you know, Harvey's a little out of it. Okay, we probably wouldn't notice it. But then we get the transfer and gas. It's episode one all over again. At least my particular issues with this. Or at least similar enough, I want to say that. Why? Because why doesn't Thorne instruct his goons to quietly take him out? Does he need Dent alive? Did, did I miss something again? It was at one point it seems like he wants him dead. Why go through all these risks? Doesn't make sense on many different ways except for plot, okay? Only reason why his goons sneak into the transport vehicle and not just have like a bomb or a sniper waiting outside to take the shot. Wham bam, thank you man. And maybe I missed why they don't just kill him and not take him alive. Because you find out the fucking goons hired. You find out the goons are Flask and Bullock. And shown, at least Flask will kill people for the smallest little reasons. So I'm just not understanding it. But okay fine let's move on he gives the not a girl boss barbara a chance to escape and follow dense kidnappers 
More importantly, it gives Bullock and Flash some screen time and, you know, a little bit of character development, which I actually think is good here. And some of the interaction between Harvey, opposed to the previous sort of uh, interactions between them, isn't bad. Might even be good in many regards. But the most important thing about it is it gives Dent a chance to outwit the dirty and dim duo to escape. Look, I, I don't want to be overly critical of the events after that. But uh, there seems to be two good Look, I don't want to be overly critical of events after that, but this seems to be too good, too smooth. That might sound queer, but seriously, even the many events that go wrong with their escape works out in the story's favor due to maximum tension and drama being established. But it's more of a cumulative effect of the series. How many times has Barbara been in a shootout for someone else to take a bullet? How many times have Batman been temporarily stunned, weirdly enough, just to be saved, where right after he zips off like it was never damaged? All believable, but it just stacks on up. How many times do we have a secondary character? I'm pretty sure other people have mentioned it. Batman doesn't seem like he's the main character in his own show. And this escape scene, this great, and this great escape really combines all those sort of little elements that just sort of and this great escape really combines all those little elements that's been building up so far which is just so annoying sort of like all of dense wine in here i can praise the writers overall for at least trying to make this all make sense at least mostly it's just hard to unsee this pattern once you see it you see certain characters like batman constantly needing help and doubting himself take that and compare it to barbara who rarely has these issues despite her being a lawyer and not really being trained or have experience in the field maybe you can headcanon stuff in and maybe you can justify that with him being a vigil annie for the first time but she seems to have a fucking leg up after quite a bit and being the expert why batman keeps on making more mistakes it just seems very unbalanced now it could just be my perception of the show the best way to test this would be really to do a breakdown of the show comparing several different things between you know these two characters barbara and batman how many times they screw up comparison to each other but frankly i'd rather not do that clinical of analysis of the show because i don't think i could enjoy the show even as much as I have so far if I broke it down like that. that. And that isn't even my fundamental problem with the series overall. It's more that the characters seem more like they're being used just as tools just to accomplish what the writers were trying to do in each episode. Because it seems like the character did what the story needed them to do. And sometimes it fits with what we know about the character and other times it really didn't. And other times, the audience didn't know enough about the characters to really know if they were acting within their character or not. In cases like that, people tend to fill that with whatever they previously knew about the character or try to instead of what the character would do based on, you know, visual design mixed in what the people already know about, you know, the general world to fill in those bare bone characters. That's why personally the mental illnesses or more broadly the motivations of the characters didn't seem to match what I know of people, not just these characters in general, people in general. Firebug's illness seemed to be triggered by fire in one scene, but in another scene, putting on the goggles visually indicated his sort of psychosis going on. That's why I said it would have been better for the writers to have him take his goggles off before surrendering. You had the scene earlier with the flicking of the lighter that sort of set his eyes ablaze and there were a fire still raging about, so that sort of indicator might have pushed him but that's just my thoughts on that. So for now, I'm done.